Gopi Jana Bala Bhakti Bhadhari Yashodanandana Prajatana Ranjana Ya shodanandana praja janaranjana Ya munatira vanachari Ya munatira vanachari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. 
Jai Jai Prabhu Pad Prabhu Pad Prabhu Pad Jai Shila Prabhu Pad Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pristaya, Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Niti Namini, Namaste Saraswati Devi, Bhodavani Pracharine, Nirvisesha Shunyavadi, Satyatya Pesatarine, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So we are recounting the travels of Narada Muni as he searches for the devotee who has received the greatest mercy from Lord, Lord the Supreme Lord. Uh, Becomes quite noisy in here eh? with the rain. Okay. So Narada Muni had come to the the Pandavas in Hastinapur. After hearing from Hanuman, he went to find the Pandavas, and he went to Hastinapur, where the Pandavas were staying. And Narada Muni is glorifying the Pandavas that you are the greatest devotees. You got the greatest mercy from the Lord. And we heard how uh, even devotees like Lord Brahma, when he wants to communicate to the Lord, he had to stand on the shore of the milk ocean and wait for some kind of uh, message to come from Sweta Dweep. So, in comparison to the Pandavas, you know, Lord Brahma doesn't get much reciprocation from the Lord. The Pandavas are so fortunate. Whenever there's any problem or any difficulty, immediately the Lord will personally come there. And he's always very personally concerned for the Pandavas. He becomes, a, he, we heard he, he was a messenger and he was a charioteer. And he did the night watch sometimes also. He would do the most menial services on behalf of the Pandavas. And the Pandavas, they would want to do the most menial service for Krishna. So they had this loving bondage, the very deep friendship between Lord Krishna and the Pandavas. And we heard that... Uh, 
Lord Vishnu in his different avatars, he will kill the demons, but they don't get liberation. Just like demons like Ravan and Kumbhakarn and Haranyakashipu, Haranyaksha, Kalanimi, these different people, different demons, they were killed by the different avatars, but they didn't get liberation. But when Krishna kills, that's special. When Lord Krishna comes and kills the demons, they will get some kind of liberation. And there are so many examples of the demons who Krishna killed and how they got liberation. Either they would get impersonal liberation into the Brahma Jyoti, or they would even get sometimes directly into the kingdom of God. So this very special how Lord Krishna relates to the demons that he's so compassionate and so caring even for the demons who are enemies of the devotees. When the Lord comes and kills them, they get liberation. And it was described, there was only one devotee who got pure devotion. One devotee of all the devotees, that was Prahlad. Although there were many different devotees of Lord Ramachandra, Lord Ramachandra, he gave, he gave liberation to some of his devotees, like uh, Sugriva and Guha and Maharaj Dasara. You know, they all got liberation, but they didn't get prema. They didn't get the real goal, the highest goal of devotion, which is to develop prema love of God, that is very rarely given. So Prahlad, he had received uh, devotion by the grace of Lord Nisringa Dei. So Prahlad Maharaj was a very special devotee, that he was granted pure devotion. Then uh, we hear how Lord Krishna relates to some of the different enemies who are there and how kind he is to them. For example, King Kamsa. Now King Kamsa, Kamsa, remember, Kamsa is not one of the doorkeepers from Vaikuntha. Sometimes people mistake that Jain Vijay, one of the births was Kamsa. No, it was Dantavarka and Sishupala in the third verse. But Kamsa, in his previous life, he was the demon Kalanimi. And Kalanimi was killed in the battle between the, the demigods and the demons. So Kalanimi became Kamsa in his next life. And as Kamsa, he performed many atrocities. We know how he killed the, the six children of Devaki. That was actually the curse that the six, these six children of Devaki in their previous life, they had been the sons, they were the sons of Kalanemi. And, but, but what they did was they worshiped Lord Brahma to get, they worshiped Lord Brahma because they, they, they wanted freedom from death, from the demigods. So they worshiped Lord Brahma.
Hiranyakashipu was like the grandfather of these six sons of Kalanimi. So Hiranyakashipu, when he found out that these grandsons had all worshipped Lord Brahma independently of him, he was very angry and he cursed them that, all right, in your next life, you will take birth as the children of Devaki and you will be killed by Kamsa. So the person who was their father in one life became Kamsa in the next life and he killed them. Of course, didn't know that these were his sons, but the previous life they'd been his sons. And next life he came and he killed them. So these were the six children of Devaki. So Kamsa performed a lot of atrocities and he sent his different friends around Braja also. And he ordered that they should kill all the young children born in Braja. This was Kamsa dealing. On the order of Kamsa, so many different demons went around and they were killing the young children. But the children they were killing were all the children of the demons. The devotees' children, they were protected. The devotees' children were protected, just like Rohini. Rohini had been sent to Gokul to the home of Nanda Maharaj for her safety. And the other wives of Vasudev, they were also there in Gokul. Vasudev had many wives, but the main two were Vasud, uh, Devaki and Rohini. So Rohini was there in Gokula. She was safe. Her children, no harm came to them. But the demons were going around Braja and they were trying, they were killing all the children and they killed the children of all the demons. So that was Kamsa's uh, order, but we see how it worked in favor of the devotees. Actually, no harm can come to the devotees because they take shelter of Lord Krishna, so they're protected. So, uh, Kamsa was a very demonic person, and he, when at, at the time of Devaki's marriage to Vasudev, when he heard that the eighth child of Devaki is going to kill you, then Kamsa became immediately angry and he was ready to kill Devaki. And he was ready to kill Devaki and it was only by Vasudev's political maneuvering that he was able to get Kamsa to agree not to kill Devaki. And Vasudev promised that they would deliver all the children which they gave birth to. He would deliver all the children to Kamsa. But this was Kamsa. He was such a demon that he, he would not hesitate to kill his own sister, even at the time of her marriage. So that was the kind of person Kamsa was. Actually, I had from Bhakti Charu Swami. I don't know where he got it from, but I remember Bhakti Charu Swami, he was talking about Kamsa. He said, actually, Kamsa was, uh, the mother of Kamsa was Padmavati. Padmavati was the, the wife of uh, Surasin, Surasin, uh, Surasin, huh? Surasin. Ugrasin. Ugrasin, Ugrasin, yes, Ugrasin. And uh, she was raped. She was raped by a demon. So the result was Kamsa was born. So this is why Kamsa has such many demoniac qualities because the birth conception was very irreligious. So uh, Kamsa. He was such a, a demonic person that he put Vasudev and Devaki in prison. He kept them in prison 
And each year when they give birth to a child, he would come and kill the child. The, when it came to the eighth child, then he tried to kill the child, but it rose up into the air and she revealed herself as the goddess, the goddess uh, who is worshipped by people in different names, Mahamaya, Vaishnavi, Narayani, Durga, these different names. So she manifested herself in that way in the prison house of Kamsa. At that time then Kamsa became a little bit repentant and he wanted to let Vasudev and Devaki out of jail. But anyway, then he heard from Narada that the child was already born, some other, you know, the child was born in another place. So he wanted to kill all the children. And he tried to then get Krishna and Balaram to come. They, he, he couldn't find out the children. They, he, he sent his men around killing the children, but they couldn't find out the children uh, who was actually born to kill Kamsa. But then he heard from Narada how Krishna was actually living there in Vr Vrindavan in, in the, as the son of Nanda Maharaj. So then Kamsa sent Akrura to bring Krishna and Balaram to Mathura. And Kamsa had arranged a wrestling match. And not only a wrestling match, but he'd arranged also for a big demonic elephant named Kuvala Yapida, who would be there at the door to the wrestling arena. And Kuvala Pida was meant to actually kill Krishna. He was a very nasty, ferocious elephant with big, sharp tusks. And Kamsa's idea was that when Krishna comes there, the elephant will charge Krishna and Krishna will be killed. So the, but then he thought, if the elephant fails, then we have the wrestling match. And Kamsa had brought special wrestlers to fight with Krishna and Balaram. So this was the scene in Mathura. Of course, everything failed. Kuvalayapida failed. Krishna defeated the elephant and killed the elephant, as well as the, the keeper of the elephant. And then Krishna went into the wrestling arena along with Lord Balaram. And Lord Balaram and Lord Krishna fought with the wrestlers and they killed the different wrestlers. And then Krishna went to the arena. Well, Kamsa was watching and Kamsa became furious when he saw all of his attempts fail. Then he drew his own sword and he was challenging Krishna. He wanted to kill Krishna and he ordered that all the people of Vrindavan of Nanda Maharaj should all be arrested and put in jail. And, Different Kamsa was he became very angry and he, he was planning different uh, atrocities against the devotees, against Vasudev and Devaki. He said they should be killed for their trickery. He wanted to do so many things and he came after Krishna wielding his sword, but Krishna defeated him and knocked him to the ground, and then Krishna put his foot on the chest of Kamsa. So Kamsa, <clears throat> he left the body at that time with Krishna's foot on his chest. So very special. You know, we yogis, they meditate on the lotus feet of Krishna. So Kamsa was so fortunate that he gave up his body with Krishna's lotus foot on his chest. Actually, Kamsa was always thinking of Krishna at every moment when he would try to sleep, when he would eat, wherever he would go, he could not stop thinking of Krishna 
because he knew that this child is the one who is going to kill him. So he was thinking of Krishna, but his thinking of Krishna was in a negative manner. It's not enough to just remember Krishna, but we have to think of Krishna in a favorable way. So Kamsa is an example of someone who is always remembering Krishna, but in an unfavorable manner. Anyway, uh, Kamsa got this opportunity by the grace of Krishna that he gave up his body with Krishna's foot on his chest. Just like when you defeat someone, you may put your foot on them, you know, and stamp on them, you know. So Krishna put one foot on top of Kamsa's chest. And then he also dragged Kamsa to, to let people see that Kamsa was actually dead. Because Kamsa was so powerful, the demigods couldn't do anything. The demigods were all afraid of Kamsa. And he had so many demons who were in his service. And the wives of Kamsa, they were all the daughters of Jarasandha. So sometimes it's said that the, the Chankazi was Kamsa and Jarasandha was the Nawab Hussein Shah. Uh, Jarasandha came as Nawab, Nawab Hussein Shah, the governor of Bengal. So like that, these two personalities, sometimes it's said they come in Chaitanya Lila, Jarasandha and Kamsa. Two very, very powerful demons. But the interesting thing is that after Krishna killed Kamsa, then Krishna personally arranged for the funeral for King Kamsa. I, I was in Thailand. Well, it's one of the countries which I preach in is Thailand, Bangkok. And some, a couple of years back, the king of Thailand died. The king of Thailand left his body. He was elderly. He was already 80s, mid-80s. And he gave up, he died. And after his death, it was a very big event. And they kept his body in state for some time. You know, in the Vedic culture, somebody dies the same day they bury them. Like Bhakti Nityananda Swami Maharaj left his body recently. That same morning, they put his body into samadhi. So that's the Vedic system, but somehow in Thailand, the it's a Buddhist country and influenced a lot by the Buddhist culture. So they kept the king's body in state for some several time, for a month, more than a month. And when people were coming, there was this huge line of people every day who would all come to offer their respects to the king. And people, state leaders even came from foreign countries, from America and like that. They came just to offer their respects to the king, to the dead body of the king. And they did this huge ceremony. It was a very big ritualistic ceremony. And they burned a lot of sandalwood and they built a special chariot to put the body on when the body was cremated. It was a, you know, they did a really big thing. So similarly, when Kamsa died, because Kamsa was the king, he was the ruler of Mathura. He'd taken the throne. So Krishna arranged a big state funeral and all the people came and he brought the people from Braja. Nanda Maharaj, the cowherd man, they all came from Braja because they were all paying taxes to King Kamsa. When they came for the wrestling match, at that time they brought yogurt and ghee and different things to pay to King Kamsa. 
So when he died, they all came for the funeral. They all came for the event. And Lord Krishna personally attended it also. And then Lord Krishna put the father of Kamsa on the throne. Ugrasena became the king. So that, that is very interesting to see how Lord Krishna related with King Kamsa. Although Kamsa was such a demon and he was really the enemy, but Lord Krishna took so much care and concern to do the funeral nicely for his departed soul. And then not only for King Kamsa, but also for the wrestlers. Those wrestlers in the arena at Mathura who had been fighting with Krishna, they were blessed because they're fighting, they're holding Krishna. And sometimes, you know, you get your, you put their arms around and they like that. So they were doing, they were having these different exchanges with Lord Krishna and Lord Balaram. They were so fortunate. Yeah, they were really being blessed to embrace the Lord and to hold the, hold the Lord's hands, you know, when they wrestle, they put their hands in each other. And so these wrestlers were fighting Krishna and Balaram in this way. So certainly it was a blessing for them. And then finally, Lord Krishna, Lord Balaram killed them. Chanura, Mustika, these different people, the wrestlers, they were all killed. And when they were killed, again, Krishna arranged the funeral for all these wrestlers. And Krishna organized the thing that they would get a nice funeral for their dead bodies, for their departed souls. And so this is Lord Krishna's compassion on his enemies, you yeah? know? Although they were the enemy, but Lord Krishna is so thoughtful, so caring, that he arranged everything for their funeral. Then, of course, there were other people. There were people like Sishupal and Dantavarka. They, although they were special demons, Lord Krishna didn't care much for them because they had been very, they'd been very offensive to the brahmanas. They'd been offensive to the brahmanas and the cows. So Lord Krishna didn't worry about these two, Dantavarka and Sushupa. He knew that they're going to go anyway, they're going to go back to the gatekeepers. They had to come as demons. So they're, that was the end of their curse. But another, another demon, of course, was Putana. And Putana, she was able to come in the form of a gopi. She was actually a witch. And it said somehow she had entered there into Braja just in the evening. And witches, they often come in the evening at that time, you know. Sometimes they, they fly on broomsticks. <laughs> so anyway, Putana, somehow she entered into Braja and by her mystic power, she could transform herself to take on the appearance of a gopi, looking like a young lady gopi. And they'd never seen her before, and they were puzzled. Who is she? And she would say, oh, I, I'm the wife of a brahmana from Mathura. And then the, she bluffed her way and entered into the home of Nanda Maharaj. And baby Krishna is laying there. And this Putana looks so charming that everyone is totally bewildered by her attractive feminine nature. You know, sometimes you get these women, they have a lot of shakti. <laughs> you know, they can just bewilder the minds of materialistic men. 
Not that the men of Nanda Maharaj's home were materialistic, but just because of her very feminine nature, because of her very charming appearance, they were completely covered. You could say maybe it was Krishna's arrangement himself, as the power of yoga maya that allowed Putana to come in. And she comes in and she can even pick up baby Krishna. So she picks up baby Krishna and of course her intention is to feed the poison on her nipple. She wants to feed this to baby Krishna. And Lord Krishna is so kind, he accepts it. Although he knows this is poison, but Krishna is so kind, he accepts what she's, he thinks, she wants to be my mother. So Krishna accepts her breast and liberates her. And she got liberation. Aho bakiyam stanakala kutam jagam sayapayana dapiya sadvi labegatim datri uchitam tananyam Oh, just think how merciful, who could be more merciful than Lord Krishna? That although this woman comes with poison on her breast to kill him, he accepts her and takes her to be his mother. Well, not exactly mother, but nurse, datri, datri means a nurse, like nurses like Ambika are there in the spiritual world. Not that she's on the level of Mother Yashoda. She's a demon. She'd been a demon. But still Krishna took her to the spiritual world. He took her into his Braja Lila. And she can be his nurse there. And what about Putana? Well, she gave up her body with Krishna's lotus feet on her chest. Just like Kamsa had his Krishna's foot on his chest, Putana also gets Krishna's tiny lotus feet on her chest. And when, and of course Putana, she reveals her huge body. He has a body eight miles long. And just an astonishing size of a body and little baby Krishna's crawling on her chest. She's calling out, leave me child, leave me, leave me. At that time she gave up her body. Lord Krishna is still crawling on her chest. Mother Yash, all the gopis, where is Krishna, where is Krishna? They're looking frank frantically around and then they find baby Krishna on the chest of Putana. And so that body of Putana, because Krishna accepted that body, accepted her breast, he purified her of all of her sins. And that body became very fragrant. When the people of Braja, Nanda Maharaj, he had gone off to Mathura and he just got back in time. And when he got back in time, he saw this huge body of Putana there. He saw this body and thought, what is this? Then they found out what had happened, that she was some Rakshasi who had come, tried to kill Krishna. So then they chopped up the body of Putana. They chopped it up just like you would for firewood. So they chopped up her body. And when they burned it, her body gave off the aroma of a guru. The aguru oil is very fragrant, beautifully smelling. So when they burned the body of Putana, it was like that. It had the aroma of the guru scent because Krishna had purified that body by accepting her breast. So like this, 
we hear about how how Krishna is so merciful to even the demons, even those people who are demons, who are inimical to Lord Krishna. Krishna gives them so much mercy, bringing them to the spiritual world and taking away their sins. So the Pandavas, they're also so fortunate that they are the intimate friends with Lord Krishna. That Krishna is so kind to his enemies, how much more kind he is to his friends, to those who are devotees. So it's very special how Lord Krishna relates with the devotees that Lord Krishna shows the special sweetness, his all attractive feature. Everything is in perfection in the body of Krishna. Of all the avatars, it is Krishna who is the origin of all of the different incarnations. So all of the, all of the good qualities, everything is found in perfection, in full, in the body of Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna wants to relate with his devotees. He gives special pleasure to his devotees, like the Pandavas. So in this way, Narada Muni, he wants to glorify the Pandavas, to let them know how fortunate they are that they enjoy such nice relationship with Lord Krishna. Okay, any questions? Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, wanted to ask about uh, Putana, that he, she got a causeless mercy of the Lord. common uh, for uh, in general that is a kripa uh, which she got so generally the living entities need to do sadhana uh, and then perfect their lives so one explanation i heard that krishna doesn't give that kripa to everybody because uh, if a jiva is capable of perfecting his life by sadhana Sadhana said, then Krishna gives that jiva that opportunity so that the ultimate destination will be better than Putana. Because Putana's destination was dhatari, little far, not very intimate. But by sadhana, if he can make it very intimate, then Krishna gives that chance. That is why it is taking some time, but the ultimate thing is good. So is it correct? Is it right? <laughs> well, it sounds all right, yes. Sounds logical, I know. Yes, Putana, the relationship is not so, not so intimate, although he takes her to the spiritual world to be his nurse, but still there's some distance there. That she's not like Mother Yashoda. She's not one of the intimate gopis, but she is one of the milk nurses of baby Krishna. So she enjoys that rata. So you're saying if we do sadhana, that Putana she hadn't, she was that she somehow she got some special mercy from Lord Krishna. Well, we have to understand also, Putana is not an ordinary demon, <laughs> right? That to actually get that position to actually go there to Braja and to enter into Braja and to enter into the home of Nanda Maharaj and to be able to pick up Lord Krishna. Just the fact that she could do these things indicates, you know, that she's, she has some very special shakti to, to be able to achieve that kind of uh, position 
with Krishna is not at all ordinary. So we have to understand she must have done a lot somehow in previous lives just to get that position, to come to that stage that she could go into Nanda Maharaj's home and pick up baby Krishna. Who was she in her previous life? Sometimes they say she is the daughter of Bali Maharaj. And as the daughter of Bali Maharaj, she'd seen Lord Vamanadev take everything away from her father. So she has some bitterness towards the Lord. I don't know, Prabhupada doesn't say that, but some, sometimes it's said like this. So who, to understand these, who are these demons, they're, they're all very, very special personalities that come into Krishna Leela. To get that, you say, Kripa, causeless mercy, that Krishna took her back to Godhead, it was his Kripa, but she, certainly has a lot of things going for her that she wants to she wants to feed her milk to she wants to give her breast to krishna of course as, you, as we could say like kamsa unfavorable but always thinking of krishna so she her relationship was with krishna she wanted to give the breast to krishna she wants to poison krishna but she wants to do it in a particular way. Somehow, she's not just thinking, come there with a big knife and carve, her up, cut, carve up baby Krishna. But she wants to do it in a very cunning manner, offering her breast to Krishna, being and showing this mother, motherly affection. So there's some deeper purposes there behind the Leela. You could say Krishna's causeless mercy, but who gets that causeless mercy? You know, to get that causeless mercy, just like who gets honorary degrees? You know, who gets an honorary degree? Rabindranath Tagore got an honorary degree, but why did he get honorary degree? Because he wrote beautiful books or poetry. He wrote some novels and things like this, and he got the attention of the academic world. It wasn't that they just thought, oh, Rabindranath Tagore, he's a good guy, we should honor him. No, he had done something to achieve it, to get that honorary degree. We could say, oh, it's costless mercy. They didn't go and study and everything, but they do something to get it, right? To get the honorary degree. They have to have some kind of purpose, some kind of achievements behind them. It's not that they just give you causeless mercy, but you, you do something to earn that causeless mercy. And so similarly, also Putana, we could say causeless mercy, Krishna very merciful to her, but she also has some special qualifications there to come into Krishna Lila, to be in Krishna Lila, to come to Braja and to be able to pick up Lord Krishna. Who could do it? Yeah. You cannot imagine. Just like, could you imagine? You, you, we, we may think about Prabhupada. You think it was so easy to walk up to Prabhupada and just be with Prabhupada? Yeah, not so easy. Very powerful, very intense. You know, not just anybody could just go up there and be with Prabhupada and sit with Prabhupada. So, how much more it is true? to actually enter into Krishna Leela. Very special. So, who gets causeless mercy? 
Only special souls. They have some special shakti, some special qualification to do service. Okay. Any other question? Yes. But can we also uh, uh, tell that it is Krishna's independent nature, Swarat, to give decide who, whom he will give his causeless mercy? <laughs> yes, well, that's certainly true. Lord Krishna is Swarat, he's fully independent. Certainly, he decides, he can decide, if he decides everything who should get his causeless mercy. He's the, he's the supreme controller, so he, it's all up to him. Yeah, he decides everything. Can we say it? Lord Krishna is not independent, of course. He, well, he, in some ways he's independent, but at, at the same time he's conquered by his pure devotees. Pure devotees, they conquer Krishna and he becomes controlled by his pure devotees. He will arrange who is going to get his causeless mercy. Right? Who gets his causeless mercy? The, the, the Dvijapatnis. The Dvijapatnis, they were special ladies, the wives of the Brahmanas. When Lord Krishna was hungry, no breakfast one morning, so they, they went to the Brahmanas, they went to the Dvijas who were doing a yagya, and they got ignored. So then they went to the Dvijapatnis. And the Dvijapatnis immediately came running to Krishna. They wanted to offer everything to Krishna. We could say Kaliya. Look at Kaliya. He got Krishna's mercy. Krishna's lotus feet on his head. The, the, the marks of Lord Krishna's lotus feet were imprinted onto the hoods of the Kaliya serpent. So Kaliya, the most envious, poisonous serpent living in the water of the Yamuna. But Lord Krishna put his lotus feet on the hoods of the Kaliya serpent. So we could see that's in the, the Krishna's independence, his causeless mercy. But then Kaliya is also no ordinary snake that he had come there to the Yamuna. He had taken shelter in the Yamuna. It's very difficult for us to ever understand the pastimes of Lord Krishna. Therefore, all we can simply do is hear of the pastimes of Krishna and offer our prostrated obeisances at the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Otherwise, we can never, we can never understand, we can never explain everything about Krishna, because it's all inconceivable. Krishna's Shakti is inconceivable, and his different dealings with the devotees, as well as the demons, is inconceivable. We can just simply hear and become amazed, more and more amazed, how wonderful Krishna is. This is, I, we, the main, we, should, we want to understand how wonderful is Lord Krishna. 
And in this way, we can fix our minds on Krishna. Okay, any other question? Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much for wonderful class. Uh, I have one confusion that you have explained when Putana came to the Braja, then Brajavashis are get bewildered. So sometimes we are facing some that kind of situation and we are might be in bewildered. So how can we overcome that situation? How can we overcome bewilderment? You are, uh, uh, well, we have to understand there's, a, there's yoga maya and maha maya, right? There's maya working in different ways. There is yoga maya, which works on the devotees, just like for Krishna's pastimes. Sometimes the devotee will become bewildered. Mother Yashoda will become bewildered when she sees Krishna, when she looks in the mouth of Krishna and she sees the universe in Krishna's mouth. Then she will become bewildered for a minute. Bewildering. And the other time, Lord Brahma became bewildered when he came. He had stolen away the cows and the cowherd boys. And he came back and he saw all the cows and the cowherd boys were there. But then he saw that they were all Lord Vishnu. And he saw the super soul in everyone. He saw the all pervading super soul everywhere. And Lord Brahma became bewildered seeing the potency of Lord Krishna. So that kind of bewilderment, this is due to the, the maya, yoga maya, Lord Krishna. Sometimes it, the yoga maya will act in a way which reveals Krishna, will reveal the opulence of Krishna. And when we actually see the opulence of Krishna, it's so unbelievable, it's so inconceivable, we become bewildered. And then Krishna will use the yoga maya to cover up himself. So that again, we will see Krishna not as God, but we'll see him as a child. Just like Mother Yashoda, one minute she sees Krishna and she sees the universe in his mouth. And the next minute she's feeding her breast milk to Krishna and she's thinking about my son. Krishna is my son. One minute she sees Krishna picking up the Govardhan hill, and the next minute she thinks, oh, my son, he couldn't pick up the Govardhan hill. It must be my husband who's doing it. So like that, this is yoga maya. It, the bewilderment of the devotee by the arrangement of Krishna. But we also become bewildered due to maha maya. By maha maya, then we identify this world as belonging to us and being for our enjoyment. So bewilderment is due to this forgetfulness of Krishna. When we forget Krishna, we forget that everything belongs to Krishna and it's for his pleasure. When we forget that, then we become bewildered because we're, we're, we have material desires and we're thinking the world is for our enjoyment. So we get bewildered. We forget our constitutional position. Constitutional position is dasos me. I am the servant. We have to remember our constitutional position that we are all eternally the servants, then we will not be bewildered. The bewilderment comes when we forget Krishna, 
And we want to enjoy without Krishna. So that kind of bewilderment, that is not wanted. There's the two kinds of the, the devotee, the pure devotees, they get bewildered sometimes by the arrangement of Krishna. And the non-devotees, the materialists, the atheists, they also get bewildered in their efforts to enjoy the material world. Because they're trying to enjoy the material world, so they're not, they cannot find happiness. It's bewildering. So we want to avoid becoming bewildered. We have to, we have to become situated in Krishna consciousness simply by chanting the holy name and keeping the mood of being the servant. Then we can avoid the bewilderment of the material energy. It's easy to become bewildered. Bewildered because we're, our plans to enjoy do not fructify. <laughs> we have so many desires, material desires. We have to conquer them. If we don't conquer the desires, we will be bewildered. And in that bewildered condition, we will find so much misery and suffering. Maharaj, there is a question online. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandav Pranam. How practicing devotees can understand the bewilderment from Mahamaya uh, against bewilderment due to our own desires? How can practicing devotees understand bewilderment due to Mahamaya and bewilderment due to our own desires? How can we understand what is arrangement of Krishna and what is our own arrangement? What Maya is brought on by our own endeavors? Well, we have to understand the arrangement of Krishna, this bewildering, how Krishna bewilders the devotees, this is very special for very pure devotees, very advanced devotees, who have no material desires. They've simply taken shelter of Krishna. So, we give the example, like even Lord Brahma, Oh, Lord, Lord Brahma, he's also a great devotee, he gets bewildered. We get bewildered, but our bewilderment is on a different level, right? Our bewilderment, we're putting our own self in the center. We're not, it's, it's not in relation to Krishna. We're trying to forget Krishna. We're trying to take Krishna out of the picture. And that's the cause of the bewilderment. We try to take Krishna out to the picture. But when we have Krishna, when Krishna is there in the picture, then that is special. That is the arrangement of Krishna. We're trying to forget Krishna. That's our bewilderment. So you can understand what is Krishna's arrangement and what is your arrangement, how much you're trying to remember Krishna, how much Krishna is there in your endeavors, and what is the cause of your bewilderment. You just have to analyze your situation. You have to look at yourself and we can understand very quickly 
Is this my doing or this Krishna doing? Krishna, of course, gives us some independence, our independence to choose Krishna or Maya. We choose Maya, it's our doing. When we take shelter of Krishna, then it's a different situation. Then we're, we're safe, we're secure. We're under the control of Krishna. But we, we've, we've gone against Krishna, we've gone away from Krishna, we take shelter of the material energy, and we get problems. We become bewildered. So we have to look, we have to analyze the situation. Have we, have we surrendered to Krishna? Have we tried to take shelter of Krishna? If we try to take shelter of Krishna, then Krishna will not bewilder us. Krishna will enlighten us. So either you get bewildered or you get enlightened. Are you becoming enlightened? If you're becoming bewildered, then it means you have, we haven't taken shelter of Krishna. We've come the wrong way. You have to check. We have to go back. We have to turn to Krishna. Okay, we will stop here. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki. Thank you.